No, but you see, I've got to explain all this because I don't, we don't know how much time there is left and I have to work on the, to finish all this work of mine while I, while I've brought in this whole pile of books, notes, pages, clippings, and God knows what, get it all sorted and organized. Thus begins Agape Agape, the final novel of William Gaddis, narrated by an ailing scholar who, in a single stream with long digressive sentences and no paragraph breaks, tries to piece together his final work, a complete history of the player piano. It is a novel about entropy, about the steep decline toward disorder in the face of globalization and the endless push for complete commodification. In an attempt to communicate an urgent message of all that is threatened to be lost, he tries to retrace all of the variables associated with and responsible for the mechanization of the arts. But he is continually interrupted, his body and mind unable to be a vessel capable of organizing his thoughts and delivering his message. Can't see across the room, everything's a blur, that's the prednisone. So they're testing the eyes, but I can read, can I? Up close, read 10.8 point, but the the standing up, just standing up, take two steps. I can't, I can't, I, I can't. It's the, not my leg. In his first novel, The Recognitions, Gaddis utilizes an elusive third person narrator through which he obscures his own identity, fragmenting all of the novel's ideas into a vast cast of characters. But Agape Agape's first person narrator is immediately revealing, readily admitting as early as page two, because that's what it's about. That's what my work is about. The collapse of everything, of meaning, of language, of values, of art, disorder and dislocation wherever you look, entropy drowning everything in sight, entertainment and technology, and every four-year-old with a computer, everybody his own artist where the whole thing came from, the binary system and the computer where technology came from in the first place, you see? Although completed shortly before his death in 1998 and published posthumously in 2002, evidence of Gaddis' obsession with the player piano dates back almost a half century. He became interested in the subject in the mid-40s when he was working as a fact checker at the New Yorker and the player piano was the subject of an article he was assigned to work on. He continued his own research beyond the assignment and eventually had an excerpt published in a magazine in 1950 and it was this work which became the basis for the eventual Agape Agape. He name drops a multitude of books, writers, musicians, all so interconnected that his streams of thought are often caught in the current of a new wave, continuously on the precipice of an epiphany. But he never arrives at his conclusion. He never gets to the point he's trying to make, always deterred, always distracted by a new thought. The experience of reading the novel is best described by Joseph Tabby in the novels afterward. Rather than reiterate music history, Gaddis would invite the reader to experience the work's musicality. His life work would be understood not by following his labor and his logic, but through listening to his voice and its several modulations. And all of these modulations eventually return back to his mortal enemy, though perhaps also, in a way, his muse, the player piano. Even if it's not necessarily the instigator responsible for single-handedly driving the artist to obsolescence, it's the symbol Gaddis uses through which all lines lead, the grandest icon which represents the problem at hand, a problem increasing ever more rapidly by the day in an age when artificial intelligence will soon put the artist out of work. <laughs>